And so let's begin with one of the two men at the center of the Senate negotiations on gun safety, Democratic Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut. Senator Murphy, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. I appreciate it. So Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says he wants a deal this week. And let's be honest, the, the, the issue here is what are Republican senators and West Virginia Democrat Joe Manchin, what are those 51 individuals, what are they willing to agree to? How close are you? What are the sticking points? So I've never been part of negotiations as serious as these. There are more Republicans at the table talking about changing our gun laws and investing in mental health than at any time since Sandy Hook. Now, I've also been part of many failed negotiations in the past, so I'm sober minded about our chances. Um, we are talking about a meaningful change in our gun laws, a major investment in mental health, perhaps some money for school security that would make a difference. On the table is red flag laws, changes to our background check system to improve the existing system, a handful of uh, other items that will make a difference. Can we get there by the end of next week, as Senator Schumer has requested? I, I don't know, but um, as late as last night, we were engaged in conversations about trying to put a package together because I think Republicans realize how scared parents and kids are across this country. I think they realize that the answer this kind cannot be nothing, um, that it's frankly a test of democracy. It's a test of the federal government as to whether we can deliver at a moment of just fierce anxiety amongst the American public. So mm -hmm. we're closer than ever before. Uh, let's see if we land it. So more than 250 Texas conservative gun enthusiasts and donors have a full page ad uh, in today's Dallas Morning News endorsing your negotiations with their home senator, Senator John Cornyn, and calling for red flag laws, which you mentioned, expanding background checks, which you mentioned, raising the age to buy a gun, a semi-automatic, I assume, to 21. It's already 21 for a handgun. Right. You didn't mention that. Just a few days ago, I have to say, Senator Cornyn tweeted that Second Amendment restrictions are, quote, not going to happen, he said. So what does that mean, not going to happen? Does that mean none of the things you're negotiating are going to happen? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I guess I also agree that we're not going to do anything that compromises people's Second Amendment rights. We're not going to do anything that compromises the ability of a law-abiding American to be able to buy a weapon. What we're talking about is trying to make sure that dangerous or potentially dangerous individuals don't have their hands on weapons. Senator Cornyn has also talked about his interest in taking a look at how we access juvenile records for these young men who tend to be 18 to 21 committing these mass murders to make sure that they can't get their hands on a weapon if they have had problems with the law in the past. Uh, so I, I think there's agreement amongst the negotiators that we're going to take some common sense steps that do not compromise Second Amendment rights. We are likely going to pair it with some significant mental health spending, which will make a difference as well. And I think everything Senator Cornyn has said is consistent with the negotiations we're having. Listen, we're not going to do everything I want. We are not going to put a piece of legislation on the table that's going to ban assault weapons, or uh, we're not going to pass comprehensive background checks. But right now, people in this country want us to make progress. They just don't want the status quo to continue for another 30 years. Is raising the age limit, as these Texas conservatives say they want to happen, from 18 to 21? Because disproportionately, crimes committed with semi-automatic rifles, I've seen statistics that show, are disproportionately committed by people, men, between 18 and 21. Is that on the table? I mean, I think right now we're trying to figure out what can get 60 to 70 votes in the Senate. It is true that the reason why 18 to 21 year olds are banned from buying pistols is that at the time that was seen as the most dangerous weapon that you could buy. Today, I think we're realizing AR-15s are in fact the most dangerous weapon that an 18 to 21 year old can buy. Although right, now, I, I, I right now we need to find what has 60 votes. Yeah, I mean, most of the when you look at the gun statistics, still. Most of the gun deaths are suicides, right. and most of the homicides are still committed with handguns, not AR-15 style weapons, correct? Well, and that's why the red flag law is probably the most important here. And it's not just about getting more states to pass red flag laws, it's actually about helping states implement red flag laws. So what we're talking about is you know, not just providing um, incentives for states to pass new laws, but helping fund existing red flag laws so that more individuals who are contemplating suicides can um, can have their weapons temporarily taken from them to save their lives. So we had a great report done by Leila Santiago, our correspondent in Florida, who did 
who looked at what happened in Florida after they passed red flag laws after the Parkland shooting in 2018. And she had, I think it was the Pasco County Sheriff talking about how effective they worked. And it had me thinking, why, doesn't, why don't you just take all the laws that the Florida governor and the Florida, uh, and the, 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 who was a Republican, and the Republican-led legislature in Florida, all those laws that they passed after Parkland. And they did a lot. There was a waiting period. They raised the, the age from 18 to 21, red flag laws, uh, hardening schools so that they, they were safer, et cetera, et cetera. Why not just take that, make that the template? That Republican governor who signed it is now the Republican right. senator who's leading the charge for Republican Senate elections, right. Rick Scott. Why not just take that and say, this is a great law that Republicans passed in Florida. Let's make it national. Well, Senator Scott, then Governor Scott, passed that law in Florida because it was the right thing to do, but also because Republicans saw it as good politics. And we have to make the case for Republicans that right now this is good politics, that if they want to get reelected, then they cannot stand in the way of the common sense changes that we're talking about right now. We're going to take a very quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to State of the Union. I'm Jake Tapper. We're back with Connecticut Senator Chris Murphy. Apologies. We had some technical issues with his microphone that have since been remedied. So uh, let's go back to what we were talking about, which was the fact that Republicans in Florida after the Parkland shooting passed a whole sweeping mess of reforms. And my question is, why don't you just take those and make that the template and say, look, this was this is Donald Trump's home state. Rick Scott, the head of your Senate campaign reelection committee, signed these into law when he was governor. Republicans in the legislature in this you know, very pro-gun state, they, uh, they were on board, and why not just make Republicans vote for that? So I think, as I mentioned before, we are broadly trying to figure out what has 60 votes, but I think the template from Florida is the right one, which is do some significant mental health investment, some school safety money, and some modest but impactful changes in gun laws. Um, that's the kind of package we're putting together right now. That's the kind of package I think can pass the Senate. Although I would say that uh, Florida did raise the age and it you did. can purchase a semi-automatic rifle from 18 to 21. It doesn't sound like that's going to be in the package you're talking about. I mean, again, right now we're trying to discover what can get to 60 votes. But I will say this. As Senator Cornyn has said, there is interest in taking a look at that age range, 18 to 21, and doing what is necessary to make sure that we aren't giving a weapon to anybody that has during their um, younger years a mental health history, a juvenile record, uh, often um, those juvenile records aren't accessible when they walk into the gun store buying as an adult. So we're having a conversation about that specific population, 18 to 21, and how to make sure that only the right people, law-abiding citizens, are getting their hands on weapons. In 2016, after the Pulse shooting uh, in Florida, the Senate voted on four gun bills. The two Republican proposals would have made minor improvements to the background check system and would have allowed the government to temporarily block someone on the terrorist watch list from buying a gun. You voted against both because you thought they did not go far enough. Do, in retrospect, do you wish you'd voted yes? No, because we had much better legislation on the floor at the time. So it was, in many ways, a choice between the two. Um, we have since then passed some of those improvements to the background check system. That's really the only gun legislation that's passed in the last 10 years. And uh, I'm glad that this time around, uh, we have far more Republicans that are willing to work together. We don't need to have competing proposals on the Senate floor next week or the week after. We have to have one proposal that can get 60, 70 votes from both parties. And so that's why right now we aren't exchanging offers between both sides. We are writing a piece of legislation together collaboratively so that we can avoid what happened back in 2016. Do, does it have to happen this week? Is this do or die week? And would President Biden getting involved in negotiations help? Um, I think the Senate needs to do this ourselves. Um, I've talked to the White House every single day um, since these negotiations began, but right now the Senate needs to handle these negotiations. Um, I think this week we need to have um, concepts to present to our colleagues. I don't know that we're going to vote this coming week, but we need to make decisions on whether or not we have a sustainable package in the next five days. I know you're prepared to fail. You've been through this for I don't even know how long, you know, years and years, more than decades, more than decade. Um, is it going to work? Are you going to get there? Um, I'm more confident than ever that we're going to get there. But I'm also um, more anxious about failure this time around. Um, when I was in Connecticut last week, I I've never seen the look on parents' faces that I did. Um, there is just a deep, deep fear for our children right now, and also a fear that government is so fundamentally broken 
that it can't put politics aside to guarantee the one thing that matters most to adults in this country, the physical safety of their children. And so I think the possibility of success is better than ever before, but I think the consequences of failure for our entire democracy are more significant than ever. All right, Democratic Senator Chris Murphy from Connecticut, thanks so much Thank for being you. with us. Appreciate it. President Biden